delighted, honored, privileged to be with you. And I was with you uh, almost 30 years ago. And at that time, it was John Wasson who was the president. Anyone who was there at that time? Thank you. <laughs> a few. And um, um, I have a propaganda for you because I do a column that's propaganda. So this is also a propaganda. We have um, at the law school a couple very good programs. And uh, you are very, very cordially invited to both of them. Um, this is um, on 27th, uh, just a, um, I think uh, just eight, ten days, of, ten days, nine days from here, Friday. And uh, that is the person who was instrumental in part to bring about peace in Colombia after half a century of uh, infighting and uh, thousands of people perished. And as you probably recall, um, in Colombia, during all those years, there was so much death and destruction. And finally, finally, eventually, we have um, the possibility of some peaceful um, setting in a country torn with strife. Um, and he's going to speak. He is uh, for the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights representative there. And before that, he had again in different countries done the same kind of work. You are most cordially invited. It's in the law school. And uh, as you come to the law school, uh, we won't ask you any quiz. <laughs> and uh, you are still most welcome to come in. And uh, please uh, uh, consider that as a very um, friendly and cordial invitation to all of you. I'm sorry? He was my teacher, <laughs> no, my student, yes. And he was editor-in-chief of the journal and a wonderful man. Um, you have given me an empty campus canvas and I can write anything on it because Joe was so kind. India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq. <laughs> what else is left? <laughs> Whatever is left is North Korea. And, <laughs> and I think I should begin with it. And uh, because you have given me the leeway, and as you probably know today, um, Mr. Trump at the United Nations talked about uh, the president and the dictator of North Korea. And uh, he talked, him, talked about him, as you heard, rocket man. And then he, uh, very quietly, because he always talks quietly, <laughs> so he quietly said, and he said, uh, um, he has um, a desire to commit suicide. He has a suicide wish. And then he said, um, um, we, ha we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Um, and uh, I don't know how many of you read it, uh, but uh, in the New Yorker, last week's New Yorker, there's a wonderful piece. And as you know, New Yorker, you can always get online. And this is uh, one of those um, um, New Yorker staff writer uh, who had the opportunity to go to North Korea. And uh, as he was going to North Korea, he asked if he could see Kim Jong-un. <laughs> and the guy whom he asked, he laughed. He laughed aloud. And he said, no, he doesn't see anybody. And he asked, do you play basketball? No, he didn't ask. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any event, he went there. And it's a very, very thorough and I think it's insightful look into North Korea. So if time permits you, kindly do glance at it. And I think uh, North Korea is a story by itself. 
and North Korea, if I start talking, then I don't think I can talk about anything else. But uh, North Korea is an issue that is not going to go away. And North Korea is a place where no matter what we are trying to do at the present time, because of their quest for survival, and they feel that the only way that they can assure themselves that there is going to be no invasion, there is going to be no regime change, is for them to go nuclear. So the desire to say, denuclearize, nuclearize, that's um, not uh, this kind of illusory, because unless they are given assurance, and they have the assurance, and they believe in it, that uh, they are going to survive, and he is going to survive, there is going to be no end to his quest to have missile tests and to have nuclear bomb tests. And um, I, you know, I'm just thinking, as a law professor, if I don't ask a question, something is wrong with me. So how many of you know how many missile tests he has had since he became the dictator six years ago? Anyone? The number of missile tests that he had? 20? Above 50? 10? 60? How many of you think more than 70? All right. 84. More than his father and more than his grandfather had done. And I think at this stage, the point simply is that uh, to put um, all the bets on China to help us is, I think, again, illusory. Um, there are certain assumptions. One, that China wants to do it. Second, that China has the capability to do it. Third, that that irrational, maybe very rational person is going to listen to China. All those assumptions, I think, are questionable. And uh, China does not want the United States next to it, knocking at its door, because that is what they fear. They fear if the regime falls, it's not only millions going to be knocking at their doors from North Korea as refugees and wanting to come in, but also if it is destabilized and if it is a setting in which regime change occurs or the country is simply because of economic problems no longer it survives and then they don't want the United States next to them because they feel South Korea and United States, they are going to be right there and China doesn't want it. Um, I think I'm going to leave North Korea because I keep going into it and I feel like talking about North Korea. But let me leave it. I think I'll take out of these couple of things, uh, countries uh, that are near and dear to us for various reasons, especially Iraq because we went there especially Afghanistan, because we went there. Iraq and Afghanistan, because both of them are fragile. So let me begin with Iraq. You remember 2003. You remember our saying, weapons of mass destruction. You remember our saying, we've got to see that Saddam Hussein does not use those weapons himself, and also does not give those weapons to terrorists who can then have our own security jeopardized. And that is the setting in which we went there. Fast forward, I'll leave all that out, but today Iraq. Iraq is still fragile. Iraq is still trying to find its own place. And Iraq is torn, torn by, at the present time, still religious, sectarian, corruption, religious and sectarian strives, and corruption, and all kinds of problems and challenges. 
Um, I'll talk a little about ISIS later, uh, but let me take the fragility part. Shiites and Sunnis, they can't see eye to eye. You remember Saddam Hussein left, and those who came into power, they wanted to take revenge. Revenge against those Sunnis who had persecuted them all these years. And so the outcome was very simple. All Baathists will be kicked out of the army, kicked out of civil service, and persecution happened. And so that is, if you want to think about how did ISIS become ISIS? What brought it about? Because in that part of Iraq, when Shiites and Sunnis could not work together, and uh, the ruling party then was a full of Shiites, and then Sunnis felt totally alienated, and despite United States' effort, we could not succeed in bringing the country together. And that is how ISIS began, because those Sunnis alienated. In the meantime, Al-Qaeda was there, split, and there are people who had then those dreams, dreams of making a caliphate, dreams of looking back at Ottoman Empire, dreams of having again Sharia, and an extreme form of Sharia to rule the country, and that entire area to be seen as again under Islamic fold, and that extreme kind of Islam, and that is how that Islamic jihadists moved in. But back to Iraq today. And what I want to focus on is the 25th of September, you recall what's happening. It's the Kurds in the north having a referendum. That referendum is for secession from Iraq, to become independent. You remember the northern periphery. It's Iraq, it's Iran, it's Turkey, it's part of Syria. And Kurds are all along that line. And they have been asking, how come that we are not given independence? We have got all those elements that are responsible for any country's independence. We've got history, we've got number of people, we've got culture, we've got tradition, we've got language, all those things. If there are all of them, and people want to have their own country, why should they? And you probably remember those who are history buffs, and even if you don't want to have history as your favorite subject, you probably still know that after First World War, when all this Ottoman Empire had gone, countries were becoming independent. Kurds wanted to be independent. And at that time, Western powers that had the power, because Iraq, Iran, Turkey, all of them didn't want them to be independent, they were not independent. And today they are saying, why not? Why not us? And they are having voting to take place on the 25th of September. There are some who feel that it's a gamble on the part of Barzai. He is the Kurd leader, and uh, they feel that probably it's uh, a bargain chip. Uh, vote is going to be definitely for independence. United States doesn't want them to seek independence. UN doesn't want them to seek independence. Turkey doesn't want them to seek independence. Iran doesn't want them to seek independence. They want independence. And they have got at the present time, as the election takes place, as the referendum is on, you'll probably see, my own thought is, that 80, 90% are going to say, yes, we want independence. And why does the United States not want them? Because the United States feels that it will has it will be distracting, distracting attention from fighting ISIS. And ISIS, as you know, is losing ground in Iraq, losing ground in Syria. The last foothold in Syria, a small village, and you probably know today, it's today, 
that Iraqi forces have surrounded it. Iraqis already have so many ISIS prisoners, they don't know what to do with them. And ISIS is on the run. And the problem simply is that we don't know after ISIS is defeated, what's going to happen in that part. So let's go back to Iraq, Iraq's fragility. And uh, many of you know the name of the town, Kirkuk. That is the oil rich place. That is where Kurds Peshmerga came in. They did not want the ISIS to take over oil. They took over Kirkuk. Kirkuk has got Arabs. Kirkuk has Turkmen. So it's a mixed area. And at the present time in the north of Iraq, there is Kurdistan. It's practically an autonomous region. You recall, you're so kind. Thank you. Is it vodka? <laughs> so, what happened is that you recall that um, um, when Saddam Hussein had Iraq under its control, the United States provided a security umbrella. United States said, you cannot go there. So no fly zone. And that is how Kurds became independent in a way, autonomous. And they are Peshmergas who had taken over Kirkuk because they did not want ISIS to take it over. But Kirkuk is not part of the regional government of Kurdistan, of Kurds. Uh, they have got an autonomous region. Um, I'll move on, but the point simply I want to make for you is that uh, they are going to <coughs> declare that they have got a right to be independent. At that point, I think they want to bargain with Baghdad. Baghdad does not want them to be free. Turkey doesn't want them to be free because Turkey is afraid that their own Kurds who have been fighting for a long time, and you probably remember what percentage of Turkey's population is Kurd? 15, 10, 9, 8, 12, 20. So it's a sizable Kurd population. And because of that sizable Kurd population, Turkey is very afraid. And as you remember that Raqqa, the remaining stronghold that ISIS had said, it's their capital. And at the present time in Syria, these Peshmerga, Kurds are fighting. They are the best fighting force. We have got great deal of confidence and faith in them, credibility that they have achieved because of their fighting skills. And so United States wants to work with them. Turkey doesn't want them to work with them us to work with them. Iraq doesn't want us to work with them. Iraq does not give them money that belongs to them under their um, agreement because they have got their own agreement with Baghdad and Baghdad says, if you are going to try to be independent, we are not going to give you any money. Iraq has found now Turkey and Iran both saying that if you want to become, become independent, we are going to militarily intervene. So that is the kind of setting. And I asked a question, what's going to happen once ISIS goes away? Because ISIS is um, not going to survive. What's going to happen is that Al-Qaeda has become pretty strong in that part as ISIS leaves. And kindly keep in mind that these people um, they are alienated. They at the present time have perceived kind of grievances. And uh, we had uh, seen terrorists of all shades and kinds. But these terrorists are different because they feel religion, faith has given them a cause. And that cause is that Islam again ought to rule. And there should be again, just like an Ottoman Empire, a caliphate. And they feel that uh, it's Christians 
and Jews and Hindus and all these people who are against us, they are trying to keep us down. And that is the kind of setting in which you find Iraq. Um, I think I need to move on because then otherwise this wonderful canvas that you have given me, uh, I think it will stay there empty. Uh, so let me move on from Iraq to Afghanistan. And on Iraq, I would like for you to please ask any question. At the present time, al uh, who is in control, and he's the prime minister, and he does want to say at least to the United States that unlike former rulers, uh, I am going to try to bring Shiites and Sunnis together. Uh, but at the present time, um, that is again simply uh, maybe an expectation, maybe an aspiration, maybe a hope, or maybe simply giving us uh, that kind of promise that he doesn't have any desire to keep. So that is the kind of setting in which we find Iraq. And the United States doesn't know what to do with it. And at the present time, the problem simply is, and I do need to say a word about it, U.S. foreign policy for all these years has been a foreign policy that very proudly says that the aspirations and hopes that our founding fathers had, that the values that we have kept, and that is human rights, that's human dignity, that is freedom of expression, that is liberty, and that is what we consider absolutely inalienable human rights, that these are the rights that we want to see prevail all over the world. And the point simply is that work with our allies, work for these values that we cherish, and to ensure that these values become enshrined all over the world because then it would be peaceful and prosperous world. And that is the kind of setting in which until now, we have said that the United States, especially after the Second World War, and especially for the last 70 years, that the U.S. has said that these are our values. Our foreign policy is going to embrace these values. We, blessed by God, have resources, have military strength, have institutions, and based upon all that and our history, we do want to say that we can lead the free world. And we have done that. But today I think that is unfortunately under siege. And the reason for that simply is that our allies don't know if they can trust us, if we are credible enough in order to say that we'll stand by these values, and if we we'll say that we are going to stand by our allies, and from the very beginning the thought was NATO is um, um, outmoded, a NAFTA gone. So, um, you know, talking about Germany, uh, it doesn't uh, understand how to deal with the people coming from foreign countries. And uh, so alienating many of these foreign leaders. And for, for, finally, Germany saying, we've got to stand on our own. Europe saying, we've got to find our own niche. Uh, we can't rely upon the United States to provide us, not simply an umbrella for international peace and security, but as a good ally who will stand with us. And with Brexit, with all that's happening here, I think that is the setting in which I want to put Iraq and I want to put Afghanistan. So let me briefly talk about Afghanistan. Joe, I don't have a watch. And as a good law professor, I'll keep talking. <laughs> so can I take your watch for a second? And uh, please uh, ask me for give it back to you. I usually put things in my pocket, a pen in my pocket. I'll come and visit. <laughs> and I leave my pen anywhere. So kindly keep that. I am. Um, I'm so sorry. I should. I should move fast. So I should uh, speak very briefly about a um, couple of these places. I think I do want to touch upon Iran. But let me take Afghanistan first. Um, and very briefly, 
uh, what is happening in Afghanistan. Um, economy is in bad shape. Uh, totally country is fractured. Taliban is resurrecting itself uh, on the rise. And uh, the country again is torn. Corruption, problems, and that is Afghanistan. And the problem simply is that we have put not simply our wonderful young soldiers who have lost their lives, but we have also put billions and next to it in Pakistan. And Pakistan is helping all those terrorists and Taliban. And at the present time, the sad part is that Iran and Russia both seem to be helping Taliban. So that is the status in Afghanistan at the present time. We're sending more people there. There is no assurance at the present time that we have a coherent policy about Afghanistan. One thing about Afghanistan people have understood, no country has been able to have its own footprint there. Britain, Russia, we created Maha Mujahideen, gave them arms, fought Russians, kicked them out, then they kicked us out. And then when we went there after 9-11, and you recall, I think I need this digression, but I need to say that to you. You remember 9-11, that tragedy, um, such a proportion that we hadn't seen before. And uh, once it happened, then obviously the thought was we need to find a way out at the United Nations. You don't remember or remember the president of the Security Council because Security Council is the only body that can take action. And the president next day convened the Security Council, 15 members, and that president was a French person. French you remember French fries, we called them freedom fries. French, we called people who are not wonderful friends, they don't treat us right. We get there and they called us ugly American. So, but it was that French ambassador that had a resolution unanimously adopted for the first time in human history and the UN history that after this kind of a terrorist act, you can use force in self-defense. And it was the United Nations blessing that we went there. And you recall that we had other countries join us. Because here, just for a second, think about it. It was a terrorist act. Until then, how did we deal with terrorists? We dealt with terrorists as a law enforcement issue. You go after a terrorist, catch him or her, bring before a court of law, give charges, provide proof, if found guilty, then punish him. For the first time in the UN history, that French ambassador said, no, for this kind of terrorist action, force can be used. It's not simply a law enforcement issue. This is a self-defense issue. And we went there. So now, 16 years later, we are trying again. Obama tried to come out of it, sent some more people. Now we are sending some more. And what's going to happen in Afghanistan is anybody's guess. Until Pakistan, that is totally obsessed with India and India's might and has nuclear weapons and keeps adding on to them and is in Kashmir, as well as in Afghanistan, sending terrorists. Because in Afghanistan, it doesn't want that India should have a say in it, wants to have total control on its policy, and that's not going to happen. So I think that is a tough neighborhood on India and Pakistan, because I know something about India. 
I'll be happy to answer any questions about India, Pakistan. But let me move on to Iran, because I think I um, um, you're you're so wonderful being patient, but patience is not inexhaustible. <laughs> and night is young, but still you need to get out. So I'm going to take just about five ten minutes on Iran, and then we, I can answer some questions. That is. That's not good. <laughs> so if you don't ask any difficult questions, I'll answer. Uh, so let's uh, take Iran. Um, I think I'll leave most of the things out. Iran's uh, um, proxy wars, um, Yemen, uh, Iran's uh, helping terrorists, uh, Iran's desire uh, to take over Iraq and Iraq's uh, policy, foreign policy. And I think uh, if in the Syria and Iraq war, uh, there has been anyone who is a winner, it's Iran. And a winner to some extent for the time being Russia. We kept saying that as Russia gets entangled into Syria, it will learn a lesson. It hasn't. Assad is winning. Russia has got the, at the present time, chips that are in its own hands. And um, um, Russia, as a good um, a poker player or as a good, um, um, you know, I think uh, astute um, in foreign policy, Putin has shown himself that he um, knows about um, um, several hands further when uh, he is uh, playing chess. And uh, I think uh, that's probably advantage to him and advantage to Iran. But I want simply to talk about the Iran nuclear deal and the deal that um, Kerry did, deal that uh, Jawad Zarif did, the foreign minister of Iran. And you probably know that um, um, Mr. Tillerson has said that next week he's going to meet with him. Um, every three months, the president has got to certify that Iran is compliant. If president doesn't certify that Congress has got 60 days in order to reimpose all the sanctions that had been taken off because of that deal. That deal is the one that at the present time the United Nations feels has provided some stability, has been a tool that has been very helpful. And um, that deal is the one that at the present time, just yesterday, the International Atomic Energy Agency that monitors it all has said that uh, Iran is compliant, Iran is complying with it. Uh, Mr. Trump has said, and some in the White House has said, have said that um, uh, Iran is still doing missile um, and uh, perfecting its missiles and it's not complying with the deal. Um, I have the deal here, I can talk about it, but let's leave all that out, technical part. Uh, the point simply is, is the present administration going to continue with the Iran deal or not? Our allies, Britain, France, all our allies, they feel very strongly that the deal should continue. Um, at the present time, there is a kind of divided opinion as we read, obviously you don't have classified information, uh, but uh, there is a divided opinion in um, Washington as to whether we should just simply reimpose sanctions. And uh, I think Rouhani, the president, and their, you know, big uh, leader, um, both of them um, are saying that uh, if the deal uh, is not uh, continued, uh, then all kinds of consequences. And uh, Iran is capable of uh, starting again terrorism. So I think I'll probably leave it uh, the person, um, it's of uh, no consequence. And so forgive this personal reference, uh, but Jawad Zarif 
who was the foreign minister of Iran and who was responsible for the deal, uh, was uh, my student. Uh, not simply a student, but he did his PhD dissertation under my supervision. And he did it on self-defense under international law. And so he would come every week to bring a chapter to me and I would send him back with changes and uh, we would argue. He's a very bright guy, uh, but a guy who really is peaceful. I don't know if he is now or not. And uh, at the United Nations, he became the ambassador and I have got to give him credit because the only time I addressed the General Assembly was when he asked me to come and speak at the UN. And because he couldn't talk with me directly, his secretary called and said, uh, the ambassador wants you to come. And uh, he could not travel to Denver because as you probably know, that we've got a 25 mile radius. They can't go beyond that in New York. That is the area that they can be. They can't travel outside. Uh, so I think Iran is there at the present time. Afghanistan is there. Um, India, I think uh, we are getting closer relationships with India. And I think India, my personal feeling is that with South China Sea, all the problems that China at the present time is giving to the world, because as you probably know, it's Navy is just simply challenging the United States. And US was so proud of its naval presence all over the world. And at the present time, we are challenging China in South China Sea, but China wants hegemony in that part of the world. And China is giving at the present time a very clear signal to the US. And the signal is, and um, um, we have a Beijing center um, at Denver, and I've been to a few times in Beijing talking with people, and these are the mid-level, not the top-level people, but mid-level functionaries. And uh, they have repeatedly said that, you know, after Second World War, Britain had to give world leadership to the U.S. Time has come that the U.S. give that leadership to China. China is ready ready to lead the world. And after we just simply said, no longer are we going to be part of that Asian trade deal, China is saying, on our terms, new trade rules, and we'll lead it. And so that is the kind of setting at the present time that I feel very strongly that India, Japan, South Korea, these are the countries that the United States, in terms of its own foreign policy, need to work with and work with very closely in order to contain, if nothing else, China's hegemonic desires. China, as you know, is both at the present time a partner, but also a rival. And there are people who feel very strongly that in days to come, China is going to challenge the U.S. for leadership. And uh, we don't think that that day is pretty soon uh, because uh, India still, uh, you know, U.S., not India, but U.S. still is pretty strong militarily. Um, and I hope, and I'll conclude by saying it, that despite all that I have said, my hope is that our institutions are strong enough to stand and withstand any challenge that to it that comes either from the executive or the legislature or judiciary, anybody, be it the president, but if institutions are strong and can stay strong, they can withstand all that. And with that, I want to congratulate you on your 30th anniversary. I want to congratulate you for being at the present time a beacon because you bring in people, but you also are the people sitting here who are interested in foreign policy, who are interested in American values. Many of you, I know that, are diplomats. You have done wonderful work all around the world. And instead of me, many of you could have done here, stood here, and done a better job. But you permitted me to come, and I'm honored to be with you. Thank you very much. We'll take some questions from the audience. We do ask, please, that 
you keep your questions short, and uh, we will have a good amount of time to and do And you so. know that is a message to me. <laughs> no, I'll no. keep my answer short. Let's start here. Uh, what is the religious makeup of the Kurds? Um, they are Muslims, not, not Muslims as such, because they don't consider themselves Muslims. But they are the ones who are very close to it. There are some Christians in it. And uh, I think the Kurds simply say, we are a separate. We are a separate religion. We are a separate sect. And uh, we are not Muslims. We are not Christians. We are Kurds. And proud of that. OK, question here. Yes, I wanted to know some more about Iran. <clears throat> How does the uh, government actually function? We, we hear that the Ayatollah still pulls all the strings. But do they have a government structure, or is it pretty much a dictatorship? I mean, do they have a Congress? I mean, and is it functional, not just in name? I have been to Iran, but many, many years ago, all that I can give you is um, my look at Iran, and Catherine and I have some Iranian friends that um, um, I used to teach at Montreal, at McGill, and uh, there was a colleague, Iranian. We have um, not stayed in touch with him totally, but uh, talked with him all the time about until recently. So Iran is um, uh, still it, um, run by theologians. Um, it's a state in which mullahs control. They control the policy. They control who's going to run. There is a semblance of um, a democracy. There is a parliament, uh, presidential elections. Uh, they didn't want Rouhani to win again. He is, um, according to them, a reformist who does not totally believe in that theocratic kind of state. Uh, but so it's, um, it's an amalgam, it's a hybrid, it's kind of a mixture. It's authoritarian, but it's religious authoritarian. It's authoritarian, but those mullahs control judiciary, they control uh, the policies, uh, they permit the election to run, to be done, and elections are fair, but then the president has got his hands tied as to how far he can go. I have a question about India. Uh, specifically, uh, India has um, really picked up pace on a number of what they're primarily calling hydroelectric projects, but uh, projects that are going to have certain impacts on diverting even more water away from watersheds that feed Pakistan. And how far do you think Modi's willing to go, willing to push that and how hard, do, how hard back is Pakistan, particularly on the water issue, in the near term, are they willing to go? Very good. Uh, India and Pakistan had uh, arbitration on the Sindh waters, and that arbitration has been going on for quite some time. They are willing to accept the arbitral judgment, arbitral award. Uh, but uh, the point simply is that Modi is very, very popular in India. And Modi's government has done reforms. Um, I just saw the other day in the Wall Street Journal, if you saw it, almost a full page about the accomplishments that his government has done and how at the present time, not simply in the hydroelectric area, but on uh, all issues pertaining to from foreign policy to investment to economic issues, um, he, has, he has undertaken some very good work uh, how far is he going to push Pakistan? I think until now, I have seen his policies pretty rational, but at the same time, pretty robust. And so it will depend upon the context. And I think uh, he does not want war. Uh, Pakistan at times um, is being at times pretty aggressive, uh, especially because of Kashmir and terrorists that uh, the ISIS not the ISIS, but their own inter, uh, intelligence service has been, uh, IS has been giving money and training them. And so all that provocation is happening, but I think Modi is pretty, pretty astute. And my own feeling is that uh, he'll do a good job. Predictions are not easy to make, 
but. But you know, you won't remember. Why not try? <laughs> Could you share your insights on the potential success of the independence of Kurdistan, given that they are landlocked by unfriendly neighbors with an underdeveloped infrastructure and limited e economic potential? Very good. Uh, I think uh, they deserve independence. They can have independence. But at this stage, they are not going to be independent. They are not going to be independent, not because of those internal, but because of external factors. Those external factors are important. All their allies, these are European Union, United Nations, US, it doesn't want them to be independent. Not because they don't deserve it, but because the fear is that it will create instability in that region. And instability is not what the US at the present time wants, and so they are not going to become independent. I think uh, they'll have vote. Vote will say we seek independence, we seek secession, but then they'll bargain with Baghdad and get some good uh, money and resources from Baghdad. So that will be a bargaining chip. Anyone else? Question over here? Hang on. Remember, I'm not keeping you. <laughs> Keep tabs on who those who are asking questions. <laughs> two, two quick questions. I don't understand. You don't that. have three? I can come up with many more, but I'll just keep it to two quick ones. Why the shape of Kurdistan from Iran to Iraq to Turkey to Syria, this narrow band from east to west? That's one. And the other is, how much influence did the Iranian government have over the Iraqi government with regard to the Obama administration withdrawing from Iraq? With, I'm sorry, with? With, with regard to the Obama admi administration withdrawing from withdrawing. Iraq, how much influence did the Iranian government have over the Iraqi government? Very good questions. These are very thoughtful questions. I think uh, the narrow strip on the top, that is where Iraq, Kurds have been. Kurds have been there all along. And they have been wanting that strip, although you're right, it's narrow. It's all over, but that's where they have lived. And they have said that we've got many things in common. We are, because you remember when the Ottoman Empire split, at that time all that happened and they were not given freedom. The second part, I think it's simply speculation, but people who knew about that era, they say that Iran did have some say in it, because Iraq, when it said, we don't want you. And the point simply at that time was, you recall the setting. The setting was that we wanted to stay in Iraq so long as Iraq agreed that we would have our own soldiers have immunity. Everywhere that the US soldiers are, there is an agreement. And that is status of forces agreement between the countries. And the country agrees that to some extent, will have jurisdiction over what our own soldiers do. Remember that these uh, contractors, they were not given immunity and they should not have been given immunity. But even the soldiers were the ones that um, um, we wanted immunity. Uh, Iraq said no, Obama withdrew. And the speculation is that Iran did have a say in what Iraq did. Question here. Yes, I, I, I ran across a book at Barnes & Noble called, it was called Debrief, Debriefing uh, don't, the don't President. Don't believe in the Barnes & Noble book. Okay. Yeah. It's called Tattered Cover. It's cover. what? Tattered Cover. Well, it, it's a bookstore, okay? okay. <laughs> anyway, it had a, it's a great little book. It's about the analysts who debriefed Saddam Hussein after he was captured. And it's, it's pretty interesting about how surprised he was about our invasion. He was kind of our guy in the 80s, right? I mean, he really was. And, and, and the other, so my question is, should he have been surprised? And number two, I, I never really ever felt comfortable the way he was um, basically 
executed by mob rule. And I, th I think we should have taken them aside and have them court. What they did there was, it kind of really made the waters pretty murky. You'll have to forgive. Yes, I'm, I'm not going to let go. I'm going to ask you to ask a question. I heard, saw your hand. Uh, but uh, I, I um, forgive this personal reference also, but when Iraq went into Kuwait and the first Gulf War, after that, along with a couple other international lawyers, um, I had um, um, created um, a document uh, indicting Saddam Hussein under the United Nations. And there is, under the UN Charter, a provision that it could have been done. We went to the General Assembly. There were about 28 countries that signed up. The US didn't. And so that indictment went nowhere. But that is besides the point. Saddam Hussein was very, very surprised. He did not think that the United States would come. You probably remember that in Iraq, Iran war, Iraq had used chemical weapons against Iran. Iranian forces at that time, Iran had made a great hue and cry in the United Nations. Iraqi ambassador came here to give a talk. It was this kind of a group of our international oriented people. And I stood up and as a naive young law professor, I asked him a question. I asked a question about this uh, weapons, nuclear weapons being used against Iran. And he said, young man, you know who's helping us? It's Washington. Go and ask Washington. We have not used nuclear we uh, the weapon, chemical weapons. They had used it. Uh, but the point is, you're absolutely right. Saddam Hussein was our man. But I think at the time uh, that uh, he um, we invaded him, uh, he thought it was a bluff that the U.S. would not come after him, so he was surprised. And second part of it, should we have tried him? Absolutely. We should have tried him. If we felt that he deserved it, we should have executed him. But the way it happened under that mob rule was not appropriate. Yes, sir. I can't go without answering your question. <laughs> You know, I think in, I think in 1920, the League of Nations promised that there would be a, a, an independent Kurdistan. And that's, that's the part of that history that I, that I think was really, really the case. You're very kind. I should have said that. And thanks for do, doing it, because you did my job. Um, absolutely. That's what had happened. And then, you know, that was the setting in which after the First World War, although the League of Nations wanted it, others wanted it, they did not get freedom. One more from that. Madam President. <laughs> Former. <laughs> you mentioned the Iranian nuclear deal. And, of course, the President Trump brought that up today in his speech as well. Can you tell us what you think is good or wrong about that deal? Um, I think uh, that deal is the best that we could have cut under the circumstances. That deal is the one that at least for 10 years postpones the possibility of Iran having a nuclear weapon. If we didn't have a deal, Iran could proceed with nuclear weapons with utmost haste. Iran succumbed to that deal because of its economic conditions. You remember what happened when Americans were held hostage by Iran? Iran became a pariah in the international arena. Iran had violated every sacred principle of international law. As, as a professor of international law, I can't forgive him for that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I think the point simply is that that's how it happened. I guess the obvious follow-up is what could possibly be motivating that position. Motivating? What's motivating the president's position? <laughs> you know, if I could answer that, no, I, I would be next to God. <laughs> and I don't want that position. He likes to be unpredictable. And he thinks that so long as everyone considers him to be unpredictable, 
he has got an upper hand mm -hmm. and he has transactional mind and he can cut deals and I wish him success. I spent five years in Libya and came back home in the States in 1963. And at that time, Gaddafi had taken over and then he was eventually killed. And I was wondering what had happened to the overall government and economic situation in Libya from that time, because you don't find any news about that in local papers here. Thank you. Very good. I'll um, give a very capsulized, capsule version of it. Um, Libya, as you probably know, what had happened was that Gaddafi had become a total dictator. And Gaddafi had become pretty, pretty, um, at times kind of brutal. Uh, no dissent to be permitted. And when um, uh, Obama and France and England went there, you probably remember Benghazi, he was moving toward it, and he said, they're all rats and I'm going to kill each one of them. And that is where the United States went. You and I can talk about it. I have studied Libya too, and uh, that will be a story that will take half an hour, and I don't think these people have the patience, <laughs> so goodbye. <laughs>